So off camera, I've prepared the stock for my legs and my leg stretchers. So this is the point in my project where I tend to get in a little over my head. Um, just about every project I design, usually I have a good idea in my mind of what I want to do, but I don't have a good idea exactly how I want to accomplish that yet. So the leg stretchers are going to actually crisscross on this table, like so. Um, and then I'm going to have a half lap that where they intersect. On top of that, I'm going to have a curve feature on each of these stretchers. And so I need to calculate not only the angle of a, the half lap, but the actual depth that the half lap has to take place because it won't go halfway because probably two thirds of this width is going to be cut away once it reaches the center point. So first I want to determine my angles and I think all I'm going to do there is I'm going to lay out my stretchers and get them spaced the way I would like them to be and possibly uh, use my legs as uh, to help me find that location. And then once I find the right location of the stretcher, I will strike a mark with the pencil where it's located and then I'll do the same thing for the opposite one and then I will measure the angles that are made by the pencil marks and then I will get to that the next point would be determining the depth of the half laps and so let me do this part first and then I'll get to the next part sure you can see any of those layout lines but I do have the cross stretchers laid out and so now I can use a protractor to measure those angles so I'm looking at right around 53 degrees So next I need to determine the depth of these notches. So when I cut my curve into these stretchers, like this, the curve is going to go like this. That will leave one and one quarter inches left at the center line. So what I want to do is I want to cut that in half so my actual half lap will leave about five eighths of an inch right here and then my notch will be cut like this and on this one I will take 5 eighths of an inch from the top section and I'll be doing all that with that same angle that 50, what was that? 53 degree angle and I think the best place to do that is at the chop saw. I've got a, uh, a depth limiter on my chop saw and I'll be able to set this angle I think I have the capacity to set that angle and so I will grab a scrap piece of wood and I will test it out first and then if it all works out I'll be doing it to these guys. Okay so it's a good thing that I did use a test piece because I had the inverse of the angle wrong so I was saying 53 degrees and even though my chop saw has the capacity to do 53 degrees it was the inverse of that which would make it 37 degrees and so this was the 53 degree cut which was way too acute of an angle and then I took my 37 degree cut 
and I lined it up on my layout lines here and it lines up perfectly. So now it's just a matter of finding the center line and then drawing the actual layout on here which, which taking into account the thickness of the intersecting pieces of wood and then hogging out the material with the chop saw and maybe cleaning up with some chisels. I really wish I had a silver pencil right about now. So the, um, the cuts were made, I had to actually freehand one of them because my depth stop didn't uh, raise the blade high enough. But it worked out. Um, I did cut one of the slots just a little too wide. You can see the gap there, but it's nothing that a, um, a small shim won't be able to fix. So I'll, I can glue in the shim and then um, cut it off and once all the Contouring is done everything. You won't even be able to see it. You know, a lot of good woodworking um, has, centers around being able to fix mistakes when mistakes happen, and this definitely was a mistake. But instead of remaking this complete piece, I will be able to do a quick repair. So the next thing I need to do is I need to draw the elliptical shape that I'm going to cut out of these and then take them to the bandsaw and cut them out. Okay, so here you see I just drove two screws into my workbench, the exact width of one of the pieces, and now I'm going to take this piece of maple and I'm going to bend it between the screws and have the, the apex of the the bend at a mark that I have placed right here on the wood. All right, here we go. And there I have the curve that I'm going to cut out of this stretcher. Uh, I know you probably can't see it because pencil lead doesn't show up well on walnut. But it's a good way to also to eliminate flaws that may otherwise uh, distract from the piece. Um, especially on the other stretcher here. I'm using this technique to remove this pith that's in the piece of wood and this would other, this would be an unusable piece of wood um, or I'd have to make it narrower or whatever but now I can use it because I'm cutting this nice decorative curve out. So I want to attach a leg to the stretcher like this, and there's lots of different ways you can do it. Um, the way I'm going to do it is with dowels. I've got a little, you know, these dowels here. I've got this tool right here. This is a very inexpensive 
doweling jig and it works pretty good it's not super duper precise it's not like domino precise but for like 20 bucks or whatever this costs it does a pretty good job so let me show you how i do this help if i use the right okay so the first thing i'm going to do is i need to mark my no go line it just means i don't want to go past this part this point on the leg with my dowels so once I figure that out, then I you use this dowel, it, it's got a center finder. So you just stick it just like that, and it automatically centers the dowel uh, bushing. So I make sure that I don't go past my no-go line. I can usually see it through here. And once I know that I'm clear of that line, I will go ahead and drill my first hole. Okay, so now, unfortunately I can't use the centering dowels on this edge here, but I have this fence set up to be exactly 3 8 of an inch in on the center line of this piece of wood here. So I will just find a, an appropriate location for the second hole. my second hole. Now I want to attach the pieces like this so what I do is I I just fold the joint over on itself and line it up in the vise. This might take a little bit of fiddling here. Okay so now it's line everything's lined up I take a dowel, drop it into the hole that I just cut, and now this jig has a slot. And by utilizing the slot and the fence, I will be able to perfectly locate the next hole that I need to drill. for the next one. Now, as long as everything went according to plan, I can drop, do a dry fit. Always gotta have a good set of pliers when you're working with dowels. There we go. Quick dry fit. There you go. A nice, perfect-ish joint. Well, I didn't record the glue up, but it's pretty straightforward. I just glued the dowels in, you know, and, and then I glued the legs to the stretchers. And I used one of the off cuts from that taper cut that I made for the legs. And that gives me a, a parallel clamping surface, because if I tried to just clamp the legs at the angle that they're at, the clamps would just slip off. So I get nice even pressure now and get my joints really tight by doing that. Now sometimes I get a little carried away and I forget to film. So I did a preliminary sanding on the legs, and I also gave it a quarter inch roundover on both sides of the legs. 
Now I did kind of make a mistake and I drilled my attachment holes too early because um, now I can't run my roundover bit on it and I'm so I'm just going to give it a, a slight chamfer. It'll be different from the roundover. It's, these are stretchers, they won't be seen uh, that much and um, the, the small chamfer that I've marked out with the pencil here will um, minimize the uh, the profile of the stretcher and uh, give it a more elegant look is what I'm hoping and I'm just going to rough this out with a file and then I will go back with the sandpaper and smooth it all out. Now that I have all the parts sanded down to um, a consistent smoothness, it's about it's only about 120. Um, I'm going to clean it with the thinner, and then afterwards I'm going to apply um, my homemade Danish oil mixture right here to the top and the legs. Um, and then I'm pre-finishing everything, and then I will assemble it at the very end. And I don't know how much of this I'm going to record because painting is, well, staining and finishing isn't that exciting, but I might bring you in for a little bit of it. Well, I was so excited to put this project to work that I forgot to film the outro. So it's several weeks later I had to dig this out of my bedroom and get all the uh, stuff off of it that I was using um, this table for so I could bring it out here and show you all the finished product. So as I have come to expect, the finished product always appears to be smaller than what I had originally anticipated. Even though the table is the exact dimensions I had designed it for and it fits that space perfectly, there's something about um, navigating around a 3D space when you're designing something in CAD that makes the item seem like it's going to end up being bigger than it actually is. Uh, I feel like the uh, joinery that I used and the methods of construction that I used worked out really well. Um, this table is very sturdy and I feel like it is a very elegant design. So go ahead and let me know what your thoughts are on this design. If you're interested in this kind of maker content, please consider clicking on the subscribe button below to be notified for any future videos that may come out. I want to thank you all for watching both parts all the way to the end, which is right here. Don't forget all the products that I use in the making of this table will be linked down in the description box below. If you want to learn more about the tools or the products that I use, just click on the links and it'll take you to an Amazon page where you can get more information and possibly buy your own. Once again, my name is Tom. This is Southpaw Workshop. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.